Hello, friends. I'm glad you could join me today. We're in the book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts. We are moving on in the extreme book of the Acts of the Apostles. These men struggled. These men suffered. And why did they do that? For the cause and the name of Jesus Christ and the hope of eternal life. A sure hope, a fixed hope, that's by faith in Jesus Christ. They struggled so that the word of the cross would carry on through the ages. And you know what? They did a good job because here we are in 2015 talking about Jesus Christ with the scriptures that many of them wrote, which God gave to them to write, and they penned for us. All right, Acts 17, we move on with yet another heavy story of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, reason with them out of the scriptures. It's amazing to me on how many places that Judaism, or the Israeli religion, was spread throughout the Middle East, Europe, Asia. And almost every major city they went to, they found a synagogue of the Jews. It's, it was incredible to me. And Paul always took it upon himself to find these synagogues and start his ministry in that city by preaching in the Jewish synagogues. Verse 3 of Acts 17. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is the Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. In other words, lots of people were listening to the gospel of Christ. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither to us also. Kind of interesting. Um, Paul... Barnabas, Silas, the apostles, all of them, that was the last thing they did was turn the world upside down. They came to bring life and peace and the message of truth to them, to deliver them from their pagan idolatries and false religions. But when you speak the truth, understand, men of the evil sort will hate you. Because that's what Jesus came for. He came to bring a sword. Because he came to bring division. To polarize peoples, families, cities. Because in Christ, you're either on one side or the other, the sword. The sword of the Spirit cuts a line through the spiritual realm. And you either choose to be on the Lord's side, or you choose to be on the other side. To be on the Lord's side is to choose eternal life. And that is the wise decision to make. These men who hated the apostles made the wrong choice and they chose to be on the other side of the sword. Why did they do that? I don't know. Why would you choose to spend eternity 
in a lake of fire in outer darkness, separated from your Creator God, when all you have to do is by faith receive Jesus Christ and come onto His side of the sword and follow Him. He's your Creator. Why wouldn't you want to do that? It makes no sense to me. Though I realize Satan puts a blinder on people to cover them from the knowledge of seeing the truth. I can see that is happening to me when I was a youth. And I look back and I think to myself, how could I have been so foolish? Nonetheless, I made choices that changed the direction my life was going so that I stood on the right side of the cut of the sword, that I was on the side of Jesus Christ. That's why I do these Bible studies, so that you out there can make a decision. Do you want to be on the wrong side of the sword or on the side of Jesus Christ, the sword of the Lord? Do you want to be on the side of eternity or on the side of eternal damnation? That's the choice you have to make. And I do these so that, in my hope, you make the right choice. Now Jason hath received these men and do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, says these men, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. Very similar to our, our bond to post bail. Something probably very similar. So they let Jason go after he probably paid his, his, his bail bondsman. Verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. There are many churches called Berean Bible Church, Berean, and those are always a good thing. I guess if I would have thought of it at the time, I would have called Church of the Living Room the Berean Church of the Living Room. Not because we live in Berea, but because they were noble-minded. Everybody wants to think they're noble-minded, right? Nonetheless, these people in Berea were very noble-minded, and they sought the scriptures daily to see if they were accurate. And that's what we should all do. That even though you have a trusted preacher, you listen up to Mr. Bear here. What I tell you, search the scriptures for yourself. Find out the truth. See if what I've said is true. That's always the right thing to do. Search the scriptures. Don't just swallow everything. Search the scriptures and see. Therefore, many of them believed also of the honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Baal at Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. So they sent Paul out on a little ship for a little ship ride to get him out of Dodge, out of the city, lest he be killed. And that's what kind of Jesus said to do. If they persecute you in this city, go to the next and continue on your ministry there. That's, that's what he would have the apostles and disciples do, and that's what he did. A very stern, very noble man was Paul the Apostle. Verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment, unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Paul kind of sent a message to Silas and Timothy to where they were at to come up 
to Athens. So he sent the messengers. Verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. So he was out and about in this very idolatrous city, like, like, like if a Christian or I would go into a Muslim city, it would be my goal than to set up camp, take my Bible out, sit at coffee shops, and try to share the word of God with these people that are caught in, in darkness and blindness. Paul did the right thing. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, think, others said, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods, strange deities, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof speakest thou? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are very superstitious. For I pass by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Basically, he's saying, you guys are given over to so many idols, you don't know which one is true, basically is what he's telling them. And then he finds one that says, to the unknown God, so we make sure to cover all of our bases. Now, this is what Paul says. He kind of plays on that. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Right, because he now dwells in us. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit, your body. And when you invite the Lord in there, then the Holy Spirit is now indwelling your body, and you are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. He now dwells in you. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before the appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device." And the times of this ignorance God has winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. One day... Jesus will come bearing wrath. First he came as a savior for salvation unto all mankind. And until this day, he's given us almost 2,000 years to accept his salvation and his gift. But the day is going to come when that time is up. And he will exercise his wrath and judge the earth for its wickedness. And he will break the seals of the scroll and bring a huge, huge tribulation of judgment upon the earth for rejecting their creator God's plan of salvation and their wickedness. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, 
Some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from amongst them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among whom are Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So they had a huge discourse, a huge dissertation, and they actually, it actually worked out really good for them because they found themselves in the, this huge stadium preaching the word of God. It'd be kind of like if they sent me to uh, preach in, in Miller Park in Milwaukee, and, I'm, and I just showed up and I had my Bible, and they said, hey, you have a Bible. Uh, do, you, do you teach and preach a little bit? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'd be more than happy to. And I come out into the stadium, and I find the stadium is filled with 50, 60, 70,000 people, and I share the word of God to them. And then obviously a few will hear and listen and believe, but the majority are, are not. They're going to hear it and say, yeah, yeah, that's nice. That's how it goes usually. But Paul had this perfect situation here where he came into this foreign land, and they put him in a stadium filled with people to hear the word of God. That's beautiful. Anyway, let's move along. Chapter 18 of Acts. We're going to kind of pick up this. Is, it just kind of rolls into the next chapter. And so we're going, to, we're going to roll in there too. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew, Jew named Aquila born in Pontus, who lately came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had demanded that all Jews to depart from Rome and come unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So it's kind of like, I'm a, I'm a preacher of righteousness, but I'm also an undercover electrician. That's how I pay my bills. Paul was a preacher of righteousness, but he was undercover as a tent maker. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews about Jesus, who he was and that he was the Christ. And when they imposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Kind of sad. He made special effort to preach to the Jews, and yet the Jews rejected him. It is very hard to preach the gospel to any man that's steeped into a false religion, a false religious environment because they believe they're, they're safe in their false religious environment. And they hate it when anybody tells them the truth, they, that they must repent. There's hatred there, there's violence, there's anger. And yet, people must hear the truth. Verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house, named Justus, one that worshipped God, and whose house joined hard to the synagogue. They were, they were close. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed also and were baptized. Then spake the Lord, to Paul in the night vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and hold on. Don't hold back. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow 
persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. It wasn't contrary to the law, but their hatred was going to come up with just about anything. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your own religion and law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Galileo cared for none of these things. It's kind of like if somebody would drag somebody before the President of the United States and say, we have this huge cause against them. And the President would say, I have no cause away from me. I don't care about these things. And then the Secret Service would beat the bejeebers out of them because they are there wrongfully accusing somebody. Kind of similar situation. I'm just not saying that happens. I'm just giving you a, a scenario so that you can understand. That's kind of what happened. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. So he shaved his head. And sometimes that's a good thing. You just cut it all off and start over. But this time it was a righteous, uh, a righteous credence, like the vow of a Nazarene. After the vow is over, then you shave your head. Verse 19. He came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God willeth. And he sailed from Ephesus. So he was very happy to be there. Um, they were very happy for him to be there, and yet Paul realized it was time to go. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says no with a purpose. Sometimes God says go. And this time he said, go. And so he sailed away from this beautiful place of Ephesus. Verse 22. And when he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order to strengthen the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto him and expounded the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them very much, which he had believed through the grace of God and preached unto them. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showed by the scripture that Jesus was the Christ. This new found man here, this Apollos, bearing a, a pagan name of a false god, was very powerful Christian and a godly man. He didn't have all the truth yet, and yet he was still persuading men to turn to God, being only acquainted with the baptism of John the Baptist, John priest of him who was to come. Jesus had come. And now they took him aside and showed him more perfectly how that the Lord had come and fulfilled that purpose. And now he is even a greater and bolder preacher of righteousness to these people, this Apollos. Kind of interesting. Um, just a, kind of an unsung hero just kind of shows up. 
He wasn't one of the disciples or apostles, and all of a sudden, he is a great man of God. That's beautiful. That's kind of, God works that way. Sometimes, uh, you know, in, uh, in life, you know, things are going kind of the status quo, and you think they're going to continue that way. And then all of a sudden, the ship gets rocked. And you don't really know why. You, you're doing the right thing. And then comes this unsung hero and picks up the word of God, the torch of Jesus Christ, and carries on the message into the workplace, into other lands, and just kind of an unsung hero that the Lord uses to further on his ministry and kind of picks up the baton where you left off. And that's kind of a beautiful thing. Anyway, I think we've finished up our study in the book of Acts for today, as far as we can go. I hope you've enjoyed. I have enjoyed. And may the Lord keep you, bless you, and give you peace. Until next time, friend, we'll see you.